Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this first lecture in a series of lectures uh, for the course uh, titled uh, Algebraic Curves and Riemann Surfaces. Um, so let me quickly tell you uh, to begin with what the goals of the present lecture are. Uh, so in this lecture we will first try to understand the idea of a Riemann surface and second we will try to look at some examples. So before we uh, begin let me uh, try to recollect some basic ideas from uh, complex analysis that is uh, uh, functions of one complex variable okay. So so we look at a function uh, so here is the so here is a complex plane uh, which we call as a z plane and suppose we have uh, an open set U uh, in the complex plane and we have a function f which uh, is defined on this open set U you can think of U as the, the interior of this, this amoeba like region that I have drawn here and the function takes complex values again. So there is another copy of the complex plane and we call this the, the omega plane where omega is the variable uh, is the image of uh, the variable z under f of course this is the this is the origin in on both planes and this is the this is the real axis this is the imaginary axis and likewise we here have the real axis and we have the imaginary axis and the idea is uh, uh, to recall what it means for a function to be holomorphic or analytic at the point at a point z0 in this open set U. So uh, recall that f of z is said to be analytic. Are holomorphic at z0 if one of the following three equivalent conditions holds. So the first condition is that if you write omega as u plus i v so that u becomes the real part of f and v becomes the imaginary part of f then we want that the first partial derivatives u x which is dou u by dou x the first partial derivative of u with respect to x and then u y similarly 
rho u by rho y and then v x dou v by dou x v y is dou v by dou y exist and are continuous and further satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations equations u x is equal to v y and v x is equal to minus u y for all z in a neighborhood of of the of the point z norm so so this is one condition that would define f to be analytic or holomorphic at the point z naught okay there are and and usually uh, this is the condition that you come across in a first course in complex analysis which i think all of you have done the 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 next condition uh, that uh, is used to define the holomorphicity or analyticity of a function at a point is the usual uh, definition the down to earth definition that the function is differentiable not only at that point but at every point in a neighborhood of that point so it is a straightforward definition so it is it is the that is what I am going to write down as the second uh, definition uh, the limit limit as delta z tends to 0 of f of z plus delta z minus f of z by delta z exists for every point z in a neighborhood of z naught. So, this is the condition that the function is not only differentiable at that point, but it is also differentiable at every point in a neighborhood of that point. And then the third condition which is uh, uh, a condition which is also uh, often adopted is that uh, the function is represented by a convergent power series in a neighborhood of a of the given point z naught. So, uh, let me write that down there exists a power series of the form sigma n greater than or equal to 0 a n z minus z naught to the power of n which is convergent. f of z for each point z in a neighborhood of z naught. So, these are the three uh, equivalent definitions of a function being uh, analytic or holomorphic at a point. Now, uh, let me make some remarks about these definitions. Uh, the the connection between 1 and 2 is that uh, the the derivative uh, can be expressed in terms of u and v okay so let me write that formula down the connection between 1 and 2 is the derivative of f is just the partial derivative of f with respect to x namely it is u x plus i v x okay and the connection between 2 and 3 is what I would call as most spectacular it is this amazing thing which says that if a function is differentiable not only at a point but in a neighborhood of that point then the function is actually infinitely differentiable that is because you see you would have studied that a power series a convergent power series if you it, it allows you to differentiate it term by term and the differentiated series 
also is a convergent power series with the same radius of convergence and since you can do this ad infinitum it amounts to saying that a convergent power series is infinitely differentiable and see requiring that such a convergent power series converges point wise to the function f of z also therefore requires uh, that f is infinitely differentiable. So what is spectacular about two uh, that 2 and 3 are equivalent is this is this amazing fact that differentiability once at all points in a neighborhood of a given point gives you infinitely infinite differentiability for all points in a neighborhood of that point okay and this is something that I hope all of you would have realized uh, when you did a first course in complex analysis uh, that is the major distinguishing feature between functions of one real variable and functions of one complex variable okay. So the connection between uh, the a n's is that they are actually the Taylor coefficients. So let me write that down the connection between so let me write it properly 2 and 3 is so the first thing is once differentiable in a neighborhood implies infinitely differentiable in a neighborhood and then the next thing is that a n's are actually given by the nth derivative of f at z0 by factorial n okay where the nth derivative of f is just differentiating f n times with respect to z so that this power series to which which converges to f is nothing but the Taylor expansion of the function f around the point z0 okay. is just the Taylor expansion So uh, this is just to recall the idea of an analytic function so we will proceed to uh, to some other to some further properties of analytic functions which I will require in the in the sequel okay now I, I also want to recall another important fact which is the following uh, so recall again an injective holomorphic map is a holomorphic isomorphism so this is again a this is again a deep fact so if you have a if you have a, a, a holomorphic map say uh, f is a holomorphic map from u to uh, to c where u is an open subset open subset okay and if f is holomorphic on u and f is injective that is if f is holomorphic and f is injective then f of u is open okay in fact f is what is called an open map it will take open sets to open sets okay and since 
f from u to f u is a bijective map you can make sense of the set theoretic inverse from f u to u and it is a deep fact that f in that set theoretic inverse is also holomorphic okay and f inverse from f of u to u is also holomorphic. So uh, the, therefore the important thing about this is that if you have a holomorphic map and you know that it is injective okay then you do not have to put the extra condition that the, the image of the open set on which it is defined is open okay that comes automatically because it is an open map which means it takes open sets to open sets and you also have the condition that the inverse map is not only continuous it is actually holomorphic. So uh, what this tells you is that whenever you have an injective holomorphic map that is actually giving you a holomorphic isomorphism with the image of the source with the image okay. So this is another thing that we would use alright. So now let us uh, try to go and uh, uh, try to understand the idea of a Riemann surface okay. So let me rub this off. the idea of a Riemann surface so what I am thinking of to begin with uh, so that we are down to earth and uh, we have a concrete grasp, grasp of it, the kind of ideas that we want to uh, formulate is the following so we start with uh, we start with the surface start with the surface Uh, say uh, like the sphere like the sphere uh, or torus or cylinder that you can you can visualize in three space okay you start with the surface so so let me uh, draw pictures of these so here is the here is the sphere s2 and then here is a torus which we call as p1 and then you can also think of a cylinder of course this uh, i'll i'll make this dotted line so that uh, I just want you to understand that this is not the boundary of the cylinder but this, this is an infinite cylinder okay. So these are all surfaces these are all surfaces that you can uh, you can imagine in three space and more more generally uh, you can also imagine you can also imagine some surface like this uh, in three space more generally any surface like this and what is it that I want to do it is the following suppose I am suppose I am given a point x0 on that surface okay and suppose I am given a small uh, neighborhood of that point which looks like a disc okay. So, so I can I can think of uh, a similar situation on each of these surfaces I have a point x0 and a small uh, disc surrounding it. So when I say a small disc surrounding it the disc is not flat you know because the surface is curved so it is some kind of a curved disc but topologically uh, you can flatten it and think of it as a disc in the complex plane. So when I say I have a point and a disc like neighborhood surrounding it I mean that there is a small neighborhood surrounding the point which topologically looks like a disc in the complex plane okay and well on a on a general surface also here is my point and here is here is my disc a disc like neighborhood okay and suppose that uh, so I let me call this more generally as x so x could be any one of the three okay or even uh, other things that you can think of and what is it that I want to do. So 
suppose suppose you are given so from d to c suppose you are given given a function f from this disk like neighborhood to c okay so it's a so it's a complex valued function okay okay so so i have a surface i have a point on the surface and i have a small disk like neighborhood d and i have a function right and this function is defined for every point on on this on this disk which means it's also defined uh, at x not and this function takes complex values and what is it that i want to do what i want to do is i want to uh, formulate a definition uh, by giving a set of conditions as to when the function f is holomorphic at the point z0 uh, at the point x0 okay so we want to define when f is holomorphic at x0 this is what you want to do okay so this is the point i have a surface i have a point and i have a small disk surrounding that point a disk like neighborhood surrounding that point and i have function which is defined on this disk and i want to say i want to be able to say in a nice way in a in an in a clear way without any ambiguity when the function f is holomorphic at that point x0 so what is it that i want i want to actually do the complex analysis that i do on the plane okay i want to do that same kind of complex analysis i want to do that on a surface okay so i want to do be able to uh, do complex analysis on a, on a sphere or on a torus or on a, on a cylinder wherever it is possible okay that's the whole idea and this is this and it's because of this that riemann surfaces are uh, being considered okay so the main use of riemann surfaces uh, the idea of a riemann surface is to be able to do complex analysis on a surface okay so well how do you define f to be holomorphic at x0 okay uh, or more generally how do you define f to be holomorphic at every point on d if you want how do you do that there is a there is a very easy way of doing it in the following sense which is also uh, very very natural very very intuitive it's the following so what we do one way to do this do this is to identify d with an open uh, subset subset say uh, the unit disk delta namely the set of all complex numbers with modulus 1 modulus less than 1 this is open unit disk by choosing a homeomorphism and by the way let me remind you that a homeomorphism is a topological isomorphism topological isomorphism phi from from d to delta so you see so i have i have my d here which is sitting inside the surface okay and which contains the point x0 and i have this function f which is defined on d and which is taking complex values and my aim is to be able to say that f is holomorphic at a point of d okay so what i do is i write i i i i take an isomorphism topological isomorphism phi from d into the unit disk in the complex plane so this is a subset of c 
and then I take this composition what is this composition this is first I apply phi inverse which is which is which is correct because phi is a topological isomorphism so phi inverse is also a continuous map phi inverse is also in fact a topological isomorphism so I apply phi inverse and then I compose it with f so I get a map from the unit disk in the complex plane to complex numbers so it is a function from uh, uh, an open subset of the complex plane taking complex values and for such a function uh, it is very easy to define uh, when it is holomorphic at a point. So what I do is that I require that this function is holomorphic at the point here which is the image of the point x0 okay so and requiring that the f circle phi inverse is holomorphic at phi of x0 okay. So I have I have just used the intuitive idea that the the neighbourhood of the point that I, that I have been given on the surface really looks like a disc. So I identify that neighbourhood with a disc in the complex uh, the say the unit disc in the complex plane and then uh, using this identification I am able to get a function from that disc in the complex plane uh, into the complex numbers for which it is easy for me to say when it is holomorphic at a point okay so it is a very intuitive definition. So this a pair like this a pair uh, so uh, in fact let me also say that I can now uh, say uh, I can extend this definition not only to the point x0 of D but I can extend it to all points of D so I can say f is holomorphic on D if uh, f circle phi inverse is holomorphic on delta because that way I have co covered every point of uh, D. So you see uh, in the same way we may say that f is holomorphic on D if f circle phi inverse is holomorphic on okay so uh, therefore you see what you can understand is uh, that this choice of this of this identification phi of this disk like neighborhood with a real disk okay this identification and this disk like neighborhood is a pair of data which is what is called a chart it is called a complex coordinate chart okay. So the, the, the pair d comma phi is called a complex coordinate chart. So I am now starting with a very uh, intuitive point of view that uh, a Riemann surface comes up as trying to be able to do uh, complex analysis on surfaces that we see in everyday life the surfaces that you can really imagine uh, concretely okay. So I am starting with that intuitive definition so for the moment my surface x is I have not defined what a surface x is uh, formally but I will do that formally in, uh, in, the, in the succeeding lectures okay for, for the moment I am taking something very concrete that you can really see. So uh, well a pair like this is called a complex coordinate chart and it is called a complex coordinate chart because it allows you to do uh, complex analysis on this uh, on this on this disc D this disc like neighborhood D on the surface. So you see uh, so that is the purpose of a coordinate chart okay a coordinate chart provides you with a coordinate okay with which you can do complex analysis. So the idea is that if you call uh, uh, yep, uh, 
a varying point here as x, then you can call a varying point here which is in the image which is in its image uh, under phi as z. So, you have you have z is equal to phi of x okay and this z is actually a coordinate on this complex plane okay. So, what you have done is that you have somehow uh, tried to give a, a position uh, a unique position to every point on uh, on uh, on this disc d disc like neighborhood d okay. You have, you have provided it with uh, a, a different symbol okay in a in a continuous in a continuously isomorphic way which is a complex variable. So, that the resulting function becomes a function of one complex variable a function which is defined concretely on uh, an open subset of the complex plane for which you can do complex analysis okay. So, so more generally what is a complex coordinate chart more generally I, I need not have taken uh, here a disc like neighborhood I could have taken just any open set containing the point and then uh, I would have to choose again a topological isomorphism of that open set with an open set in the complex plane okay. So, more generally what is a complex coordinate chart more generally a complex coordinate chart is a pair u comma phi where u is an open subset of x phi from u to v is a homeomorphism of u onto an open subset v of the complex plane okay. So, this is what a coordinate chart is okay and uh, you can now see that somehow uh, so the so the more general diagram will look like this. So, you so I have this point x say x naught and then I have some open set u on the surface and I have an identification of this by a homeomorphism a topological isomorphism of this with the subset of the complex plane. So, here is my subset of the complex plane V okay and this is a chart okay this 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 pair consisting of u and phi is a chart. And why is it useful? It is useful because whenever I have a function f defined on u taking values in c, I can call f to be holomorphic if the composite function which is given by phi inverse followed by f is holomorphic okay. So, uh, the I, I chose to begin with a disc because it is intuitive, but then instead of a disc I could have had an open set fine. So, at this moment it would appear that we could take for our definition of a Riemann surface just a surface that you we can imagine in 3 space and uh, uh, which is equipped with uh, which is equipped with uh, a set of charts like this such that these charts cover all of x. That means basically I want to do complex analysis on the Riemann surface. So, given any point on the Riemann surface it should be contained in a chart it should be contained in the u member of a chart. So, that I can use that chart to do complex analysis in, a, in, in that neighborhood of that point. So, this could be taken as the uh, as the working definition or, or the first definition okay. So, let me write that down, but uh, let me also caution you that uh, we will run into problems very soon and that will tell you uh, how the definition has to be modified. So, let me write this down. So, 
preliminary preliminary definition definition of a Riemann surface. is a surface x covered by uh, a collection of charts collection of charts u alpha phi alpha where alpha runs over some indexing set so this capital i is uh, an indexing set and uh, for each element in i i have a chart u alpha comma phi of alpha and uh, and these u alpha should cover x okay so so let me write that down x is equal to union over alpha u alpha okay this ensures that at every point uh, of x i can really do complex analysis okay using the chart that is available at that point but we immediately run into problems what is the problem that we will run into it is a kind of uh, it is a it is the following kind of obvious problem namely given a point it might occur in more than one chart okay. So uh, let us look at this situation but we run into problems as follows suppose u alpha 1 and u alpha 2 uh, both contain the point uh, x1 okay. So let us look at this situation so I have so uh, let me draw a diagram I would need a larger diagram so let me go back here. So here is my so here is my surface and I have uh, one open set u alpha 1 and it is equipped with a chart namely I have uh, a phi alpha 1 which is a homeomorphism of u alpha 1 with uh, some subset of the complex plane which I will call it which I will call as v alpha 1. And well, on the other hand, my point x naught uh, also lies in another uh, open set, which is u alpha two, which is the first member of a chart. So there is again another homeomorphism, phi alpha two, which uh, identifies this u alpha two with another open set. Uh, let me call that as v alpha two in the complex plane. So this is my situation and suppose that uh, I have a function f that is defined on this intersection okay. So suppose suppose so let me write that there consider a function f from u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 to c suppose you have a function which is defined on that inter intersection so in particular you could have considered a function is defined in a neighborhood of the point x0 okay and you could consider a small enough neighborhood so that it's in the intersection right and the difficulty we will run into is that uh, uh, is is the following uh, it's in trying to decide whether the function is holomorphic at x0 or not the reason is because we have two ways of defining f to be holomorphic at x0 so uh, there is one way one way of saying that f is holomorphic at x0 is to say that this uh, composition this composition uh, namely which is this f circle phi alpha 1 inverse this composition is is uh, holomorphic at the image of x0 under this map okay so if you want I will call that as uh, 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 z1 okay and so z1 
so z1 is phi alpha 1 of x0 and well uh, the other way of deciding that f is holomorphic at, at x0 is to require that this composition which is uh, f now followed by uh, which is now phi alpha 2 inverse followed by f is holomorphic at the point z z2 where z2 is the image of x0 under phi alpha 2 okay. So you see uh, so let me write that down clearly f is holomorphic at x0 according to to the chart u alpha 1 phi alpha 1 if f circle phi alpha 1 inverse is holomorphic at z1 and according to u alpha 2 comma phi alpha 2 if f circle phi alpha 2 inverse is holomorphic at z2. So you get two definitions of f being holomorphic at the point at the point x0 that is because you have chosen two charts uh, which uh, which are available around the point and in fact you could have an infinite you know, an, an infinite collection of charts and then uh, that would give you an infinite uh, set of definitions for f being holomorphic at the point x0. Clearly this is not something that we want because we you know that uh, the idea of uh, holomorphicity or for that matter any property of a function has to be intrinsic to the function. It is not it should not be a property that should uh, be ambiguously defined okay. All good properties of functions like continuity, differentiability, analyticity or holomorphicity these should be intrinsic properties of functions okay. They should be properties which do not depend on uh, let me say reparameterization okay because after all what these charts are doing are just reparameterizing that neighborhood uh, a neighborhood around that point uh, in terms of complex variables okay. So uh, what we really do not want to happen is that for example that f circle phi alpha 1 inverse is actually holomorphic at z0 but f circle phi alpha 2 inverse is not holomorphic at z1 uh, at z2 okay okay. What should not happen is that one of these is true and the other is a false the other is false okay such a thing should not happen okay. So how do you remedy this situation you remedy the situation in the following way you see I have uh, this kind of a situation where I do not want the function to be holomorphic with respect to one chart at a point and it is not holomorphic with respect to some other chart okay. So how do I avoid this so you see uh, it, it should be it should it should be uh, 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 same to require to require the holomorphicity using any chunk. So this is what the ideal situation is that no matter what chart you use the idea of a function being holomorphic at a point should be unambiguous because holomorphicity is an intrinsic property it should be an intrinsic property of a function okay okay because holomorphicity should be an intrinsic property of a function okay. So let me repeat it should not be that because I have different charts my definition of holomorphicity depends on the chart if I change the chart 
the holomorphicity uh, is false and for some other chart uh, the holomorphicity is true I do not want such a thing to happen. So this tells you that the charts have to be compatible in, in a certain sense and how do you get this compatibility. So you get this compatibility in the following way you see uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the above the above happens we require we require the following so let me first explain it using the using the diagram here so you see i have this this shaded region here this shaded region here is is u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 is the shaded region here and that is of course uh, it is an intersection of two open sets so it is open it is an open subset of u alpha 1 and since v alpha 1 is a homeomorphism the image of this here is going to be an open set in v alpha 1 okay. So I will I will have uh, I will get uh, uh, an open set here which I would call as v alpha 1 2 and v alpha 1 2 is nothing but is just the image uh, under phi alpha 1 of u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 okay and similarly so so this shaded region goes to this shaded region here and similarly uh, this open set u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 goes to another shaded another shaded region that I draw here which is again an open subset of v alpha 2 which I would like to call as uh, v alpha 2 1 okay. So v alpha 2 1 is v alpha 2 the image under v alpha 2 of u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 okay. And now what I want you to understand is to look at uh, this map so I, I look at this map from this shaded region to this shaded region okay from this open set v alpha 1 2 2 this open set v alpha 2 1 and how do I do, how do I get this map I first take phi alpha 1 uh, I take uh, uh, yeah so let me just for convention let me change the direction of the map so I first take phi alpha 2 inverse phi alpha 2 inverse will take this shaded region which is v alpha 2 1 into u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 uh, alpha 2 and then I apply phi alpha 1 okay. So actually I have a map from this shaded region to that shaded region okay so I call that map as g12 so what is this g12 so g12 is first apply phi alpha 2 inverse restricted to v alpha 2 1 okay that will start that will take v alpha 2 1 to uh, homeomorphically on to u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 and then apply phi alpha 1 restricted to u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 okay. So I will compose this with phi alpha 1 restricted to u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 okay. So it will go from v alpha 2 1 to v alpha 1 2 okay and you can see that this is a composition of homeomorphisms. So this is a homeomorphism okay it is a homeomorphism this is a homeomorphism because the restriction of a homeomorphism to an open set is also a homeomorphism okay and a composition of homeomorphisms is again a homeomorphism so this is a homeomorphism and what is it a homeomorphism of it is a homeomorphism of two open subsets of the complex plane okay. So I can require that to be holomorphic. So require the following homeomorphism G12 to be holomorphic after all it is a homeomorphism basically it is a mapping from an open subset of the complex plane to another open subset of the complex plane I just want it to be homeomorphic I mean I just want it to be holomorphic but the point is it is already a homeomorphism which means it is already injective. So you see by a remark that I told you earlier it is an injective holomorphic map so it is a holomorphic isomorphism so what it will tell you is that it will tell you that g12 is not only not only is g12 
holomorphic but g12 is an open map and its inverse is also holomorphic so g12 inverse is also holomorphic okay so putting this condition helps us it it makes sure that uh, you don't get a conflict in these two definitions and why is that so it's because of the following a simple observation so let me write that down so requiring g12 to be holomorphic would also make it into a holomorphic isomorphism by a remark that I uh, uh, recalled some time ago the beginning okay and now why does this help why does this condition help it helps because of the following reason because you see f circle phi alpha 1 inverse okay if I compose it with g12 okay I get f circle phi alpha 2 inverse see because if I do not worry uh, uh, about writing these restrictions which is a little cumbersome okay I just write this as phi alpha 1 circle phi alpha 2 inverse uh, with the meanings as to where these maps are being uh, taken understood then I just write g12 as phi alpha 1 circle phi alpha 2 inverse and then you know so if I in here instead of g12 if I plug in a phi alpha 1 circle phi alpha 2 inverse then you see I get f circle phi alpha 2 inverse and you see that therefore this map and this map they differ by holomorphic isomorphism and therefore this is holomorphic if and only if that is holomorphic okay because g12 has an inverse if this is homomorphic g12 is already holomorphic and this is a composition of holomorphic maps so that is holomorphic and conversely if that is holomorphic I can multiply on the right by g12 inverse to get that this is holomorphic okay so the the above uh, uh, equation tells us that f circle phi alpha 1 inverse is holomorphic if and only if f circle phi alpha 2 inverse is so there is really no conflict in uh, using these two charts to define holomorphism and now if you require this condition to happen whenever you have two intersecting charts okay in which case we say that uh, those two charts are pairwise compatible then you are in a good situation so uh, so we make this requirement that not only is the Riemann surface just a bunch of uh, is a surface which is covered by a collection of charts but these charts whenever they intersect on the intersection these functions g 1 2's okay which are called the transition functions these are called transition functions and we want these transition functions to actually be holomorphic okay so let me write that down and that gives us a very uh, uh, concrete first definition of a Riemann surface okay so let me write that down so if we require that functions such as g12 called transition functions to be holomorphic whenever u alpha 1 intersection u alpha 2 is non empty we uh, get a compatible collection of charts 
which gives a Riemann surface structure on x okay so 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 let me again repeat that so we started with trying to do complex analysis on a surface and we realized that we could do that if we had these complex coordinate charts and we want to be able to do that at every point so these charts should cover the whole surface but then we run into problems deciding whether a function is holomorphic at a point because there may be more than one chart available at that point and in order that such ambiguity does not arise we put this extra condition that for any two intersecting charts the transition function is holomorphic and once you do that everything is fine. So you just take a collection of charts which are compatible with each other okay this is the compatibility condition and that gives you a Riemann surface structure on x okay. So this is this, this is the beginning definition of what a Riemann surface is okay. So, let's, let, so let me stop here. Thank <music> you.